created the person who began the Sacrilege Seminars after Norm Phillips left some 35 years ago, 30 years ago. So I know how to do this. And, uh, and, and uh, in those days, we all did eat lunch at these, and uh, it didn't seem to matter, pointing with bananas notwithstanding. So let me introduce uh, Sid Bukabara, and he has been with NESIS and JCSDA. I never get the jargon right for all those organizations and the acronyms there. But he's been doing a terrific job with them and working with the uh, new ideas for, I guess, VDOTS analysis system and, and uh, working with uh, um, observations and uh, radius observations with them. And um, his work is extensive, and I have uh, the pleasure to have worked with him a little bit on, on the, uh, looking at the uh, quality control of, uh, of, um, uh, of, of radiances that we've had in the past in the project for a short time. So. Um, he uh, has come over to our end of, of the bottling. I think it's uh, um, relevant uh, to talk about uh, artificial intelligence, which is now the rage across uh, Europe, I can tell you, and uh, Asia and, and Australia. So the title of his talk is Exploring Using Artificial Intelligence for Now Casting and Numerical Weather Prediction. Uh, he'll tell you about the contributors. So let me introduce uh, Sid Bukabar. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity uh, you gave me to uh, make this presentation. Um, it's going to be on behalf of a team um, that did most of the work. Eric Maddy here in the room did most of the work. Um, but the team here, um, uh, Adam, Kevin, Aaron, Kyle, Nargis, and Krishna have contributed one way or another. So thank you, everyone. And I think most of them are in the room. So what I'm trying to going to convey to you is something that we have tried a couple of months ago, and it's probably no more than 10 months ago. So it's preliminary, but I think it's worth mentioning the, uh, the intermediate results at this point, because you might, you might find it interesting to pursue some of it. Um, we tried to apply it to remote sensing applications, but also to some VA applications, including PC and so on, AMV determination. But interestingly, we also tried out of curiosity to see if it has any application for predictive skills. And uh, we found that interesting. And that's why I talked to uh, Brian, and um, he offered the opportunity to give the seminar. So the construct of this presentation <coughs> is to first say why we didn't try to do that. What was the rationale behind uh, even assessing it? Then go into the methodology and the description of the tools that we have applied and then give examples of what we have found when we applied it to real data. Okay, so here's the, the big context of, of this. There is, as you all know, I'm sure, um, a multiplication of observing systems, especially from satellites. Uh, even the existing satellites, in terms of volume, there is a huge increase in terms of volume of the data that is available. And we're already facing a challenge. We need a, a, a fraction of the satellite data that we should be that, uh, that are available. Uh, in addition to the increase in the volume and the resolution as well, there is a multiplication of players uh, coming from all over the world, uh, providing with good quality data uh, that we don't necessarily have the resources to exploit for, for many reasons. So that's that's one. New players in the global observing system. There are new sensors, with higher resolutions, and therefore uh, increased volume. And there are new technologies that are already popping up, small satellites or CubeSats. Uh, what that means is that um, there would be a lot more satellite data coming our way. And if you think that we are already facing a challenge in terms of how much we are absorbing now or assimilating, um, we thought that we needed to think a little bit outside the box on how to process and exploit that data. So a significant increase um, in volume and diversity of the data. Um, the diversity of the data is not only from satellite, but it's also coming from what I call environmental observer systems that are non-traditional. And we put here the IoT, the Internet of Things, because many of the devices that we have now in society have some, some of them have environmental components to them. Uh, it could be cars, it could be houses, it could be, um, that thing I, I heard about uh, traffic cameras having observation that could be beneficial to, uh, to environmental um, applications. So there are a lot of data that, are, that have the potential to um, be a challenge, but also a welcome addition to our uh, observing system constellation. 
um, welcome in terms of improving the quality and the, the coverage of the resolution and the temporal refresh and so on, but also in terms of adding resiliency to, to the system. So no single system would be a, a single point of failure. So in parallel, we have budget constraints, HPC constraints, um, you're familiar with that, uh, higher societal impact and expectations. Many people are actually expecting um, satellite-based information, or environmental-based information, more and more. Um, this is more for Nessus. This bullet is really for Nessus because we tend to think all satellite applications should be driven by users, and therefore we are very um, sensitive to how many users are using the data. But it's a trend that we tend to control. More and more users are, are relying on satellite data. Um, how you use the expectations? Yes. We're a user, right? Yes. I mean, I mean, I mean you. you. Yes. yes. So everything we do in NEST is we have to check the box that weather service wants it. <laughs> but there is a trend. There is a trend that actually society at large uses that to satellite data, whether we want it or not. So we tend to control the requirements based, but I think that trend is, is really hard to control. But there are users that we can um, do that. So demands for increasing quantity of data simulation, you probably have that pressure on your end. Why are you using the 5% or 2% of the satellite that costs? multi-billion dollars um, to, to go and deploy. So that's the general context. This slide is, uh, this part of the slide is from ECMWF, but uh, Peter Bauer who showed this at WMO, and it showed the number of compute cores as a function of model resolution. And uh, this was done in 2016, so they must be around somewhere here, I guess. Um, and they have this trend of how much they need in, in computer cores, as well as the power perception needed to run at those resolution. And they draw this affordable power limit. So we are reaching really a limit of how much we can do um, while being affordable to, to do it. Um, on this end, this is a, a plot from um, Ken Casey, and uh, actually I got it from Jeff de Chavier, who's the EBMC chair in Investis, um, which shows actually the increase in data volume. So pay attention only to the uh, dark blue here. This is the satellite data. Only JPSS and go. That's it. And you see that there is an increase from this to this. Three times more going forward. So the challenge is going to be real. And we have to do something about it. Okay, so enough of scaring you, but uh, here's what we try to do. We try to do machine learning applications or machine learning tools to do what we do currently. The retrieval, data assimilation, quality control, pre-processing. Um, and the reason why actually the, the, the thought came to us is because uh, there was a presentation by somebody um, from IBM, uh, at the Science Advisory Board in NOAA, who presented what they had done with the Watson project for medical field. When you think about things, medical, medical images are similar to cloud images and things like that. They, they care about uh, pattern recognition, they care about the detection, they care about um, identifying certain types from other types, and so on. Similar things that we do in remote sensing and, and data assimilation. It was applied in finance, in music, uh, but the most interesting papers we found um, were for self driving transportation. And they really have the same type of issues that we have. They have to get a good sense of the surrounding by combining multiple observing systems around the car. And then that analysis, that situational awareness, allows them to make the decisions on how to go forward, turn right, turn left, and so on. So it's the same thing as what we have in data isolation plus forecasting. You have to get all the data from the observing system, get a good sense of the situational awareness. So that's the initial condition. And then you decide on the, on the forecasting. So with that in mind, uh, we thought that environmental data exploitation is a really a good candidate for AI applications. So the presentation is not meant to say that oh, we could do great things with AI. We want it only, so it's very modest, we wanted to see if it can do the same type of things that we currently do with physical retrieval and so on. Uh, but can we do it actually a lot faster? So given us basically the opportunity to assimilate more, exploit more of the data, and get more coverage, more temporal resolution, and so on. Uh, so 
one question we had, and I'm sure many people will have, is what's the difference? What's the difference between machine learning and the traditional neural networks? Those have existed for a long time. Um, and to be honest, there isn't really a, a big difference. The, the major difference is that it's easy, and now you can do a lot more um, features as, as opposed to before, because you can do deep learning, and deep is really based on the fact that you can do multiple layers a lot more than before, and uh, multiple connections as well. So it's a lot easier to, to explore the, uh, the machine learning tool. So what we applied is the TensorFlow, the Google-based TensorFlow tool, and uh, description from Eric here is that most networks uh, that are described are between three and five hidden layers of roughly 20 to 40 hidden units. Okay, so this slide shows simply the whole value chain. This is obviously a simplification of that, from the securing of the ingest of the data all the way to the forecasting. And the color code here is, in dark green, is what we have tried, and we have full confidence that the AI tools work for that application. So be it uh, pre-processing and version, quality control, and we have tried post-forecast regimen. I'm going to get to that. Uh, the light green is something that is not necessarily tested, but we have a moderate level of uh, confidence that it is actually uh, going to work, uh, given our experience. <coughs> um, and then the uh, light yellow, I don't know how much color is this here, but uh, yeah, um, light yellow is something that we have confidence. We haven't tested it, but uh, there is a reasonable level of confidence. The biggest unknown is really for forecasting, so short-term forecasting and WP. We haven't done that really. But that would be really a big question mark. And I'm sure that people would be, um, how to say, outraged at the idea of doing forecasting with, with AI. But I think it's worth trying, um, given what AI has been used for in the past and actually is being used now. Um, so, those are the things that I'm going to uh, focus on, pre-processing, quality control, and some post-forecast correction. So, when yes. you talk about AI and forecasting, are you talking about like pattern recognition and analog prediction, or are you actually talking about obvious this kind of knowledge and you know, having to kick off that kind of thing? I'm thinking about the actual forecasting, so doing the actual forecasting, either short-term or a little bit more longer, longer term, perhaps for tracking, or hurricanes, things like that. Okay. Um, so uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that we see this as, as like I said, not necessarily as improving, but as doing it a lot faster. Uh, so in that sense, I wanted to highlight that it might have really a, a, a neat uh, application to OSSEs and OSSEs, because those are known to, to take a long time to execute. All right, so the methodology and, and uh, describing what we have done just for setting the, the, um, uh, the tone on what we have done in a concrete way. So the scope of the effort, we try to focus on now casting and, and uh, forecasting adjustment. So by that, what I mean is we take the GFS forecast and we try to see if the AI tool can actually detect systematic errors. So the GFS, if it has inherent, inherent uh, systematic um, features, does the AI, is, is the AI able to detect that and correct that if it's systematic? So that's what we mean by forecast adjustment. So we focus on satellite based analysis. We haven't tried to do with conventional data and things like that. And we focused on the pilot project um, called the Enterprise Algorithm, uh, the MEDAS, uh, but also assess it in terms of short term forecast direction. Uh, we focus on these parameters temperature, moisture, and wind but also surface uh, parameters and hydro materials. Uh, like I said before, we use the uh, Google TensorFlow, and in terms of real data, we focus on APMS and CRISP. Um, in terms of training and verification, we, we obviously have the ECMWF analysis, the GDAS analysis, but we have also the G5NR. This is the major one that NASA has put together. And the great thing about it is that it's two years of independent data that you can use to train anything you want. The, the truth is known, basically. Um, a noise addition, we added unprolated version distributed noise. Um, sampling data, we use 5% of the data sampling to do the training, and the rest is used for, uh, for assessment. Um, 
Anyway, so there is independence between training, sort of independence, between the training and the verification. So this is the MEDAPS algorithm. For some of you who are familiar with the MIS algorithm, which is a one d bar system um, that, we, that runs operationally in nesters to retrieve geophysical parameters, that was extended to be applicable to not only microwave, but IR systems. And the idea was um, that we would use it as pre-processing <coughs> instead of using fixed analysis of, let's say, aerosols or, or trace gases. Uh, use the pre-processing, or the emissivity of the surface. Use it as a pre-processing to the DA, to the GSI, instead of having something that's fixed that you know is going to create issues. So that's the idea behind the media. So it has a dual use of retrieval as well as DA uh, pre-processing. Okay, and we think it's also very useful in, in uh, regions that are currently rejected by the system, like in cloudy or precipitation conditions. So that's so that's the readout. It's an upgraded version of MIRS, and this is a, an ex um, sample of uh, sensors that it's applied to. So it's a mixture of uh, microwave uh, sounder and images and IR um, sensors from geo and, and polar uh, regions. If John was here, he would be saying that, oh, this takes a long time, it's never going to um, um, be applicable to uh, operational systems. That is the reason, actually, why we try to assess whether we can do it a lot faster. So we developed what we call the MEDAPS AI, so it's an AI version of the, of the MEDAPS. Um, so that's what I was talking about, the major challenge is, is the computer time. 70% and, and of that time is actually spent doing the ready transfer to the fourth operator. Um, so that's that's the pilot project that we um, focused on, and this is the result. So what you see on the right is an ECMWF field of TPW of uh, total crystal water, and on the left side is an analysis using ATMS data for a full day using the media XIR. So at the at, uh, at the first order assessment, it looks the same thing. Uh, the major difference is that the time used to compute that. Is two hours for the regular 1D bar versus five seconds for the for the MEDAPS AI. And that ex excludes the um, the IO aspect. So that is that is a major um, I'd say advantage of doing it this way. So we try to go beyond just the eye candy assessment. So it looks good, but is it really? So we try to assess that by assessing the quality of what is being converted in terms of um, standard deviation and RMS, the regular metrics for assessing the quality against the, the simple assessment using the CMWF as a reference. We assess the geometric fitting, so if you take that, those parameters that you have inverted with MEDAX AI, and you feed them to the CRTM, to the Ford model, do they fit the observation? So that's, that's the assessment that we did here. And then the other assessment that we did is the spatial coherence. If you compute the power spectrum, does this field have the same uh, spatial coherence as an analysis, for instance, in terms of uh, how much is uh, high variability and how much is, is low variability in, in, for every parameter. And the last one is the interparameter correlation, meaning that if you're retrieving or inverting geophysical parameters, do they behave coherently together between temperature, moisture, and heat scaling? Or so the way you should you should expect them to behave. Uh, so we use uh, ECMWF as a reference to assess the correlation matrix. Um, the parameters. So there's none of that last in the, in the actual algorithm itself that says these are the ways these variables should relate together. Except for the training. Except okay. for the training okay. and the fact that when you do the MEDAX AI, you try to invert them all at the same time. So we sort of force that correlation to be there between the parameters. So Here's the first assessment in terms of uh, temperature and standard deviation for temperature and moisture. Um, ECMWF is used as a reference here, and uh, we included, so the interesting part is that we included both clear and cloudy points, um, and all surfaces are, are included. And correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, if I'm saying anything wrong in terms of uh, describing the data set. So, uh, very reasonable, we, have, we haven't um, showed other performances from other algorithms, but they are comparable to these. This is another assessment in terms of uh, surface parameters. On the top, it's real data-based inversion of uh, uh, emissivity. And on the left side, is the analytical emissivity. It's hard to explain, but if you take the, the environmental temperatures of ATMS, 
and you assume to see that we have to be true in terms of water vapor, the temperature, the T skin, and you consider only pure stuff, then the only thing missing is the emissivity. So you can analytically compute the emissivity, and there are papers about that. So we use that as a reference, analytical emissivity as a reference, and this is AI based uh, emissivity. So you take the band temperature, you apply the new batch AI, and you get the emissivity. This is simply the um, distribution of the emissivity uh, from this, it says G5 and R, but it's actually the uh, analytical emissivity compared to the AI based emissivity. So both land and ocean are inverted in, in one shot. Uh, in the lower part, of this is the G5 and R, so it's simulation skin temperature versus the AI-based skin temperature. And the main point, again, is to show that you can do the same type of thing at the fraction of the cost. Um, and when I say a fraction of, of the cost, it has implications beyond just um, the runtime in operations. It has implications on the, uh, the computer power requirements, so the hardware requirements and the cost associated with it, and so on. Um, the, the other thing that has an, uh, this has an impact on is the speed by which you can uh, come up with algorithms. It, it takes really, um, it took at least at least a, a couple of months to come up with algorithms that run now for I think five or six sensors every day. Uh, this is the other aspect of assessing the quality of those of those analysis, space-based analysis. So the convergence assessment. So like I said, you took the inversions, feed them to the RT to the CRTM and compared it, in this case, to the uh, CRIS sensor. So this is for one channel, and I forgot which channel it is. So this, uh, no, this is the chi-square. So it's a, a metric that assesses uh, the fit to all observations in CRIS. The chi-square, people are familiar with it. it. It's a measure of the residual between your simulations and your observations. And this is the spectrum. So in red is the standard deviation between the simulations and the observations. And this is the prescribed noise um, in here. And the blue one is the, um, uh, the bias. The lower part here is uh, called a miniature, uh, miniature version of the bias temperature. Right? Eric scaled them to make it visible in the same plot. All right, it seems, so it, it is behaving OK in terms of performances. It's behaving OK in terms of convergence with respect to I shouldn't say convergence because there is no iterative process here, but it's, it's behaving okay in terms of fitting the observations. Um, and then here we assess the spatial coherence. So what you see here is the power spectrum for temperature and moisture for different levels. So the green, I believe, is uh, uh, level 70, um, the red is level 57, and blue is level 45. And the solid line is the ECMWF, so it's an analysis. And the dashed one is the AI-based uh, inversion, so it's an analysis based on the AI. And what you see in temperature, they fit pretty well together. In the moisture, on the moisture side, it fits pretty well, except at the high frequency. And you'd, you'd expect that, because the analysis is a lot smoother than the actual real data. So that's why you have more variability on, on the high end uh, for the moisture power spectrum. And the last part of that assessment, so it, again, just to remind you that we did this in order to assess if using the AI gives you something that is reasonable um, at a high level, but also at a, what I call a technical level. So the convergence, the quality in terms of metrics, as well as the spatial coherence and the correlation metric. So on the right side is the UCMWF correlation. Uh, the first part here is the temperature, then you have the water vapor, you have the skin temperature. I think that, that's all of this correlation measure test. The temperature, moisture, and T-skin. And this is the AI base. So very similar features, although not exactly identical, but very similar features between the analysis and the AI based analysis. This is over ocean, I should mention. Um, all right, so at this point, it, it, it is behaving like, a, like an analysis. It, it's performing like an analysis. Spatial coherence is uh, um, behavior like an analysis, and geometrically, it's behavior like an analysis. Um, here is simply to reemphasize the same point about the timing. So what we showed here, what we are showing here, is the NIRS algorithm that, um, that that is the one device system that runs operationally for one particular sensor, and the different colors correspond to 
pre-processing. So one curve here is pre-processing, product generation, and then post-processing. That's the real. Uh, and this is the AI base. And you see that the pre-processing is the same. We share the same pre-processing. And this red color here is the product generation. So this is uh, what it takes to do the um, to do the product generation from the AI. And the rest is post-processing. So the actual thing that you need to run an operation is really a fraction of what is needed with, uh, with standard algorithms. Um, I think... Uh, uh, no, it's, it's, it's way more than that. It's, uh, I would say, a couple of minutes as opposed to... Uh, I think we computed that, Eric. Is it um, excluding the I.O., it's two seconds or five seconds compared to, like, two hours. This is the same thing, but done with only the MIDAX AI for multiple sensors. So ATMS, Chris, uh, the NOAA 18, the NOAA 20, the MEDAP, and so on, done sequentially. And the main point here is to say that uh, most of what we do is actually either pre-processing or post-processing. The small gray line here is really the product generation. So again, the same point about, about the time. Um, so, so that was that was the easy way of using AI. So take the various temperatures, compute the, compute the uh, geophysical parameters. Um, the, the disadvantage of that is that you can only trust that the AI is giving you the right results. We have done some assessment, make sure that overall it's good and so on, but you don't necessarily have uh, on a case-by-case -case basis for every single footprint a way to measure if it did the right thing or not. So uh, Eric and the team is working on that aspect. So we thought that Another way of trying to apply the AI is to take the MDR, it could be a 1 DVR or 4 DVR or whatever, and instead of doing the inversion directly, feed the AI into the forward operator. So everything else stays the same. The, the correlation matrix, the updating <laughs> of the state vector, um, the iterative process, all of that remains exactly the same. But instead of using the CRTM per se, you replace it with a CRTM AI which is a lot faster. So you change the engine, basically, to make it a lot faster. But nothing else changes. So this is a way to diminish the, um, the reliance on something that you can't really control at uh, the um, So that's, that's what we tried here. And this is the result, or at least uh, results as of a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago. Uh, we're still working on improving this. This is an example of CRTM AI the field of uh, channel 21 for, I uh, believe, ATMS. This is the actual um, uh, CRTM simulation. So, and we try to fit the CRTM itself. So, uh, again, at the high level, it looks exactly the same. And this is the difference between the two. <coughs> this is the difference between the two. And when you put them in a scatter plot, this is what you get for channel 21. And this is what you get for channel 6. Channel 6 is a temperature sounder, so it's a lot easier to simulate there. Um, than the, uh, the channel 21. So the, the main difference, again, is 1.3 hours for the regular CRTM versus less than a second to speed in the I.O. aspect. Okay, so now to deflect the criticism that this is not physical and so on, I just want to remind uh, ourselves that actually the CRTM itself for the absorption coefficients is based actually on the regression. So this is just taking it a step further and doing the whole simulation of random temperatures based on AI. So there's nothing wrong with it. And, and, and again, um, we could have done this with respect to the line by line as opposed to the CRTM, which would actually reduce further the uncertainty between the AI CRTM and the uh, CRTM itself. So uh, some uh, disclosures there. Um, EOF of geophysical data has, uh, has been used as input, only clear sky, only surface blind channels, so really the lower troposphere and up. Um, ATMS only tested, um, about a million points used for training and testing. We haven't done the for the Jacobian. This is something that could be uh, extended. But if you have it for the forward simulation, there's nothing that prevents you from doing the Jacobian. At worst, you can just use the forward simulation and use final differences to compute the problem. Uh, so this was a quick test that we use CRTM as the reference. But in theory, you should actually use the line by line as the reference. 
Uh, potential advantages, I think I mentioned this already, it, it could improve basically the efficiency of uh, physical retrieval, EA, data fusion, and, and so on. Um, so it doesn't replace line by line, it uses them as, as training, obviously. Okay. Uh, this is really uh, excuse me, someone is not muted. I can hear the breathing and sneezing and that kind of things. Please mute yourself. Thank you very much. All right, so we talked about the AI used for the, uh, for the uh, transfer from the geometric space to geophysical space. We talked about the AI as it's used for the forward operator. And now we've got into the question of can we use it, does it have any predictive aspect to it? Um, so we came up with an absolutely simplistic model that would try that. So what we did is, for every point, imagine time minus one, so that's the past, and time zero is the present. And all we did is took a, a cube around that point. So it's a three by three by three, okay? And you could imagine this for temperature, cloud, uh, water, and, and, and so on. A very simplistic. And the idea is to use it um, to predict, first of all, the AMV at this point. So the AMV depends on the future, water vapor features, and so on. So could we predict the AMV at this point, given the surrounding environment and the preceding environment, okay? But you can also expand that model. It's very simplistic again. It's not planning to be really uh, sophisticated. <laughs> but can it be also used to predict time plus one? So we used six hour as the, the T plus one. So can we do that? Can we try to predict t temperature and moisture at time t plus one? And can we determine the AMV at time t zero uh, given the moisture and the temperature of the cloud and so on? So that, that's, that's the model that we have applied. Right? We have a lot of room for improvement and sophistication. At this point, it's, it's really simple. So for the AMV, this is the result simply. The, the, the U at 250 uh, millibar. The V, and this is the difference with respect to the uh, nature of. So this is only simulation where you know where the truth is. And the performance in terms of the wind speed is given here with a standard division of 1.8 meters per second. And this is the difference in the wind direction as a function of wind speed. And we know that at high wind speed, there is a lot more uncertainty in the, uh, in the wind direction. Uh, there is also here some ambiguity of, of zero uh, versus uh, 360. So not that if you take an, a, a regular algorithm that does the wind vector retrieval, you would see similar results, basically. So that's what AMD um, performance is. And then we try to assess the, um, the forecast adjustment. That's what I was talking about before, the forecast correction. So what we did here is um, try to follow me. So we have the target as ECMWF, and it's not the judgment call on ECMWF. Okay? It's just used as a reference to see if there is any uh, potential for systematically <coughs> assessing the, the, uh, the differences. So ECMWF is used as a reference. You take the GFS, valid at the time of the ECMWF analysis. So it's a six-hour forecast. Mm -hmm. And you use it as it is, or you apply an AI correction to it before you compare it to the exact same analysis. That's it. It's just a correction assessment. Um, and what you see here is the GFS minus the SMWF, and this is the AI correction applied to the same GFS. Okay, so it's a, it's a whole field. You don't see much when you see this, except that maybe there is a slight uh, decrease, and this is TPW, by the way. So in terms of statistics, if you put those into Spectrobot, you see that uh, this is the SMWF versus the forecast versus the GFS. And this is the one where you have a tidal uh, GFS correction. So there is a slight decrease in the, in the standard deviation from 1.8 to 1.75. Um, so not much. But what we found interesting is that if you do look at the increment, the, uh, we were surprised to see that the AI is not producing something that is completely statistical and that's it. It's actually changing features. So it's changing dipoles. So it's moving front from one area to another. And this is based on the training that was using to set up as a reference. So it, it is doing something that is geophysically coherent. It's not completely statistical and, and that's it. Um, so that's that's basically the the main um, 
bulk of the presentation. Um, and to summarize what I already talked about, there is a, a large increase in, in number and diversity and sources of observing systems, from the global observing systems, um, that presents an unprecedented and, uh, in my opinion, a welcome added resiliency to the, uh, to the observing system. Uh, however, it presents a challenge on how much we can do with that. Um, so this is an attempt to, to try to see if we can use machine learning to, to do that. Um, it doesn't take away the, the physics, and I should have started by saying that, it doesn't take away the, the need to have physical models and so on, because you obviously need training to do the AI. But um, <coughs> using it for efficiency reasons is, is something to consider. So the competing constraints perhaps require us to explore new approaches, like I said. Um, and the AI is um, able to produce at least the satellite base analysis are found to be logarithmically consistent, with spatially consistent, and geophysically consistent with traditional analysis. Um, uh, Re-emphasizing the goal, uh, it's not to show that we can do better, but, uh, but simply to uh, see if we can do the same type of quality, but uh, at, uh, with much more efficiency in doing so. Um, the different components that can benefit from the AI is obviously the pre-processing slash the inversion, the data assimilation, the ready transfer, the QC, the data fusion for now casting purposes, um, and MWP if we manage to have uh, good quality uh, data assimilation. So what we found is that the results are encouraging so far. Um, we are continuing, uh, continuing to work on that. Um, the AMD is actually shown, not down there. Um, and when we did the feasibility of forecast correction, there are some good signs that uh, it might be working as well. Um, training is key, obviously, for AI. And uh, we are lucky to have the, uh, the NASA colleagues provide us with the nature run that we use for some of the training here. Um, in pursuing the AI applications will have impacts on the HPC, like I was saying, reduce the pressure on, on the HPC and the process associated with it. Uh, it could benefit from new environmental data, um, so from more satellite data, but also from other uh, sources of uh, environmental data like the IMP. Improve the latency, uh, reduce the cost of running legacy systems, data as mentioned and remote sensing. Uh, increase the percentage of how much data you can absorb without of breaking the bank, um, and reduce time for running uh, impact experiment uh, uh, assessment experiments. So, and perhaps improve the forecast if uh, we have more effort to in, in the field. And that's all I have. <laughs> more questions? I got two questions related to training. I was wondering how long training takes within the process, and then the second one, is there under, any unforeseen concerns about using training um, with actually going through this kind of process? A, an instance where it could fail and yield the wrong result. There is always that there's, so for your first question in terms of time, and Eric might be better placed to, um, to answer that question. Do you know how much it takes to do the training? Really what you do is you turn it into a flat What's the range of groups that you can see? Perhaps some of these. Usually, it's, uh, you go around the circle about two times. Uh, minimum, sometimes it goes down the top. You can also do that. You can 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 do that. Well, that's, that's something, enough. That's, that's something, enough. That we're, yeah. we're, that's something, that's something that we're working on. Because it could be some kind of adaptive thing. So, 
So we do product monitoring on series and We have a data process and some instruments. And we're looking you know, at seeing if the error is there over time and how they change over time. Um, and that's one thing that we currently look at is how often do we have to update the data that we have to look at. Now, in the beginning of the whole project, our aim was to touch many things, but not dive too much into them. So it was proof of concept was the, the key word here in this project. Proof of concept. So there's a lot of uh, improvements to be made at the training level, the presentation of the training set, at the adaptive training, like Eric was saying, how to make the, the training automatic. It's not you do it once and then that's it. So how do we make it automatic and adaptive on a regular basis? Um, your other question about how do we make sure that the results when we apply it are, are, not, are not wrong. That's something that we are pursuing, I would say, is our major effort now is to see if we can determine not only the virtual physical product, but the uncertainty that comes with it. And I will be working on that. I'm looking forward to <coughs> discussing this uh, with Vladimir after this and well, the, 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 long, the long and the short of it is, um, the biggest issue in the least real experience we've had in the new network of the three decades is that uh, the problem is you, you can only train for what you have. And so it, the, the, the hard part is the extremes you can get in them on. And so there's two ways of dealing with that. The one is to try to get everything in your training data set, which will never happen. The other one is to uh, have some kind of quality flag that you can estimate objectively whether your uh, whether your neural network is all is right or not. So that's something that Vladimir has uh, introduced and what you do is you go forward and you go backward. And if the forward and backward are not mapping to each other, then your neural network is work right. So the backward and, and forward are all AI. Yeah you have you have an AI going forward, you have an AI, AI going back to your original observation. Yeah. If those two go far away, you have an actual objective measure whether you have trained for that condition or not. So that, that's a fairly simple, straightforward way of dealing with it. And that leads you to the quality fighting in the lab and the other way. It's like, okay, this is repeated in AI, but I don't believe this. Yeah. So yeah. That, yeah. Another, another that, that's a very powerful thing to do. Yeah. And what a more data propagation of what they were doing. Perfect. That's exactly. And then we gave it some help. And, um, and we did the same thing. We tried to. Um, to do the uh, six minutes of Boltzmann to go and wait model uh, with the EOF mapping. Uh, we did the same thing. We, we noticed that uh, if you went back and forth and it was not right, then we didn't use the fast one, we used the slow one. And that, that created a, a stable, not, not, not as effective as the, 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 the stable solution. Uh, if we have time, I have a, a bigger point of issue with it. First of all, I really appreciate this because I believe that this is truly different truly a useful thing to speed things up if nothing else. But you have to be extremely careful how you do this, how you apply this. Mm -hmm. Because if I understand this correctly uh, from your slides and the training and things like that, uh, if, I, if I be the devil's advocate, uh, this is a paradigm change. Because we used to try and get our models to create the best possible description of the nature. If you follow your thing, we are trying to reproduce a European center. <laughs> we can defend ourselves again. Right? Well, no, we, we're not trying that. No. We could have done the nature wrong as a reference. This was simply the, the, the point the point is the point is not the point is not this qualifying what you're saying. The point is you have to be extremely careful how you do this and how you train this. And so yeah, yeah. so so if you have a very expensive analytical solution, it's really easy because you really try to reproduce the physics in there. If you go what you did to reanalysis data sets, you're literally starting to try and reproduce the reanalysis data set instead of nature. And that is a very dangerous thing to do. And, and it's something that, that uh, some people have done over the years with other approaches too. Uh, an example is uh, SAR wave spectra. You only can see a part of the, of the spectrum space. So people started off with having the first guess for the model, and then collect <laughs> that first guess and go forward uh, that way. And so the, the algorithm was used, was used in the European Central Rate model. So the only people who used that data were the Europeans because it showed that the data 
this was really reducing the weight of it, was really doing a good job that everybody else refused to use that because we want to reduce weight of the model. And we have we've had that same issue too with, um, uh, I think Fogny did some work very long ago with the scenario tree, which he basically showed that, uh, that sometimes these first guesses or what they have trained against is actually dominating the signal rather than the, the observation. So you need to find some kind of objective way of estimating whether you are reproducing what you what what nature is or reproducing uh, what what is uh, in your training data set. And the issue is really about building the right training data sets. And you may you may want to think about not trying to map directly to the, net, the analysis but go a little bit further up the chain what the expensive part of your your retrieval zone. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm completely in agreement on the fact that the key is really trained, so no question about it. Um, this was a good concept to see if we can reproduce some sort of reference. It could be, so in, the, in this case, but it could be the tree, no matter how you define that. But the mechanism is the same. Now, the big question is, what is the tree? What do you consider the tree? Is it, is it a model? The model has systematic errors as well. And that's what we are trying to show, that you can correct for those systematic errors or displacement or, or in some way. But I agree with you. If you know the truth, I'm, I'm all for using it as well. Uh, questions on people who dialed in? Anyone? Yeah. Could you, uh, could you read it? You don't have to board there for us. Yeah. I can't see. There is, uh, I think we should go up a little bit. Oh, I, okay. I have one. We'll get you as soon as that one's done. Uh. Okay, you, 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 you move, so uh, I don't know. Uh, no, uh, just to, first part is just to, I'm asking. The question is related to the type of the depth. Uh, network. There are different architectures and simple So next one, the same this process. This is about the architecture, and I think the other next, one is Next one is uh, how can we deal with the long term? Um, at this point, we are not taking into account the time dependence of, of variables. We're taking what we've seen here, what we show here, is you take analysis um, with, with various temperatures associated with them, and we do the training. So it's, it's a, a snapshot in time. We're not necessarily accounting for the um, uh, correlation. Yeah, uh, it, is it possible to read? The question is, how can we deal with long-term dependency of variables for the correlation? Are we using a special deep neural network like LSTM? I don't believe we are doing that. Yeah. I mean, at this point... Uh, yeah, if, if you can't hear me, yeah, it's my question. And, uh, yeah, we are working with the same kind of... Uh, uh, we are in the same kind of problem. That's why I am asking if you are implementing some uh, time-related deep neural network architectures like RNN or LTM for considering the effects of uh, long-term time dependence. Uh, could you introduce yourself? Thank you. It's yeah. Hard. Oh, my name is Nasir El Hamda. I'm uh, calling from Santa Cruz. The no officer. Thank you for the question. The only thing that we are doing for for um, the time and for accounting for the time evolution is this model here that I'm showing in the slide, where we it's a very simplistic model where we take a cube around every single point uh, in the in the analysis and we take it at time minus one plus time zero to the present, and then we try to predict time plus one. Um, and whatever the model is, or whatever the training that we are given to, to the training uh, has in terms of temporal evolution, is going to be captured through that training. So we're not forcing any temporal correlation there. Oh, okay, Except thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. this is interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, good question over here. Uh, Hi. Yeah. CRT related, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like that, actually. That's a, a very promising, I think, in the future. And uh, I, in the past, uh, I did some work, like 10 years ago, I wrote the neural net uh, network package in Portland by myself. So, uh, by, for the training, regarding the training time, what, what I found is a very time-consuming 
by training it's a self it doesn't take a long time. But however it takes a long time to set up the uh, optim optimal configuration, say how many headings you have to use, how many nodes you select, what kind of safety criteria to, to control the conversion, all those kinds of things. But different problems, it's a different. So my question is for the today is a full package. Is that everything is like automatic for the problem or do we still need to spend more time? Yeah. 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 Right, but if you still need to I found that this works out of all. Once you find the optimal configuration, you have to stay in the same time. I just have a, uh, just a question about it. I mean, the AMS, uh, the AI, AI meeting, one of the uh, questions raised, I think I listened to some of the people, about the, the physicality of this, you know, how do we understand the physics of any phenomenon and its application to the AI. So that's kind of, I mean, you touched on that. So I was just thinking aloud, like, uh, if you use the retrospective data for multiple Hiking tracks and, and use the AI, can we really learn something deeper in terms of you know, the tracks and what are the deficiencies of whatever system that we train with? And then do some kind of a comparative study. So, European Center did perform very well compared to the TFS. Those kind of differences can be really amplify it and then uh, bring it to the front. Yeah. It's, it's a good question. I mean, we haven't tried all these different tracks, but that's something that is in our mind. Do we add value by trying an AI-based system? Uh, it remains to be seen, because in those situations you have convection, you have things that pop up, things that, that disappear, and things like that. I'm not sure how training would, would behave in those conditions. But at the end of the day, it's a physical model that you have in h or, or, or GFS uh, with, with equations. There's nothing magical about the predictive aspect of what you do. I mean, collectively, it's an equation that you go, why not? I mean, you could actually do that with the added advantage that if you have something flawed in your system and you have a way to detect that, so the reference that you can train it, then you can actually provide a correction on top of your physical model. So I, I see them as complementary more than more than uh, computing to the other design of efficiency. Okay, with that, why don't we thank you for an interesting seminar. Thank you.